Hey, church. So good to see you. So good to be back in uh, the great state of Idaho. And uh, it was great. I uh, uh, had a trip last week to Kalispell, Montana. And so I went from the valley to the valley. And it was great. I will say it was a little less smoky in Montana, but preaching for a great friend of mine, great church called Canvas Church in Kalispell that's reaching the state of Montana. And a good friend of mine is on the tail end of a sabbatical. And so it was great to be able to get away and support him and encourage the church. But I will tell you, there is no place like home. And it is so good to be back, um, as my wife would say, where you belong. Amen. All right. Uh, but I'm just so excited about all that we have coming up. Men, last week to get registered for man camp. Uh, I have a feeling we will sell out. And so we are already 10, 20% ahead of last year and the campground is limited. So, uh, man, if you want to go, grab uh, your registration. It's going to be so much fun. And I promise you're going to encounter the Lord. It's going to be fantastic. And then listen, mark your calendars. August 14th, we are having our, uh, our summer revival night. And we're just going to pursue the presence of God and believe for amazing things to happen. And if you've been believing for a miracle, a breakthrough, a touch from God, this is going to be your night. And uh, my friend, Pastor Russ Johnson from Seattle, is going to come down. I know he's got a word for us. So, uh, man, let's just get excited about the things we have going on the rest of the summer. We're going to finish the summer strong. And I just can't wait to see all the Lord has for us through the rest of this year. Amen? Amen. Hey, last thing, I want to encourage you. We've got a couple of weeks left and a lot of these invite cards. Man, grab one of these invite cards. You know, listen, great churches, they're not just built around preachers and worship leaders. Listen, great churches are built around the people of a body, the local church, inviting their friends, inviting their family, bringing people with them to the house of God. You know, Jesus said it best. He said, listen, he was telling a parable. He said, go into the highways and byways and invite them to come that my house would be full. And I just know it's God's will that his house is full. And so listen, I want to encourage you. We've still got a handful of empty seats around here. They could be filled with somebody you know and love uh, that needs to know the Lord or just be encouraged in their faith. So let's be inviting our friends and family. It's going to be a great next couple of weeks as we finish out our series, AKA. Amen? Amen? All right, grab your Bibles. Turn with me to Genesis 14. We've been in a series of messages called AKA, also known as. And we've been looking at the various names that are attributed to God throughout the scripture. There are many different names that are clearly given to refer to the Lord throughout the Bible. As a matter of fact, depending on how you look at it, there are over 75 different names that the Lord is referred to by and as. And each one reveals a different part of his character and nature. It's interesting. I think every person is like this, but especially the Lord. I think the Lord in in many ways is like a diamond and he has many different facets depending on how you look at him. And so every name that is given to the Lord in scripture shows us a different facet of who he is, of his character, of his nature, of how he loves us and moves in our life and the way that he operates. And so to know and to understand and study the names of the Lord are to better understand who he is in our life. And so we've been going through these names and I believe today is gonna be a great blessing to you as we look at another name given to the Lord in Genesis 14. So I've given you all the time I can. Let's Genesis 14, starting in verse 17. We're gonna read together. Come on, split your Bible. Open, and actually don't split it far. Genesis is the first book in the Bible if you're new. Uh, But just turn there with me, turn your Bibles on, and let's read together, Genesis 14. Starting in verse 17, we're introduced um, to this picture with Abram, who would later be known as Abraham, um, but he is known as Abram here. In verse 17, it says, after Abram returned from his victory over however you want to pronounce that king's name, and all of his, come on, you got to be able to laugh in church, amen? Amen. After Abram returned for his victory over that king right there and all of his allies, the king of Sodom went out to meet him in the valley of Shava, that is the king's valley. And Melchizedek, the king of Salem and a priest of God most high, brought Abram some bread and some wine. Isn't it beautiful to see a picture of the new covenant table even 
in the book of Genesis. Some bread and some wine. And Melchizedek blessed Abram with this blessing. And he said, blessed be Abram by God most high, creator of heaven and earth. And blessed be God most high, who has defeated your enemies for you. Then Abram gave Melchizedek a tenth of all of the goods he had recovered. It's one of the earliest times we see the tithe all the way since Cain and Abel were bringing their first fruit offerings. Long before the law, we see that Abraham gave Melchizedek a tenth of all the goods he had recovered. I wanna read you verse 20. And blessed be God most high who has defeated your enemies for you. Would you pray with me? And let's ask the Lord to prepare our hearts for his word. Father, we thank you right now just for the opportunity we have to be here today. I thank you for your word, that it's alive, it's powerful. It always does what you send it to do. And so God, would you prepare our hearts today? I pray this word would not go in one ear and out the other, but Lord, it would find a place to land in our hearts that we might be built up and our lives might look more like Jesus because of your word that is taught to us today. And we believe for this and pray for it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 In this passage, it's interesting, the Lord appears to Abram, not in an angelic form, like he would appear to Hagar, who we talked about a couple of weeks ago. He would appear not in an angelic form, but he would appear in the form of a great king, a priest and a king. As a matter of fact, there's a lot of dialogue around the person of Melchizedek. There are some who believe that Melchizedek was an actual ancient king that ruled and reigned in the ancient times, that he would have been an actual person that was a priest of God, perhaps a descendant of Seth or something like that, an early ruler in the Bible. I do not believe that. I believe what most scholars believe, that Melchizedek is actually one of the earliest appearances of Jesus in all of the Bible. He's an appearance of Jesus himself. Matter of fact, Um, The New Testament reaffirms this in the book of Hebrews, and I want to read this to you. Hebrews chapter 7, let's read verses 1 through 3 together and just do a little more study on this person because it's important to understand the source is to understand the name that he gives to the Lord. So Hebrews 7 verse 1 says, This Melchizedek was king of the city of Salem and also the priest of God Most High. When Abraham was returning home after winning a great battle against the kings, Melchizedek met him and blessed him. Then Abraham took a tenth of all he had captured in battle and gave it to Melchizedek. The name Melchizedek means king of justice and king of Salem means the king of peace. Now listen to verse three. There is no record of his father or mother or any of his ancestors. No beginning nor end to his life. He remains a priest forever, resembling the son of Almighty God. Melchizedek was no earthly priest, and he was no mere man. Melchizedek is Jesus Christ, and an early appearance of the Lord. And in this text, the Lord appears, and he identifies himself and God to Abraham as El Elyon, or the Most High God. And today I want to talk to you about that name, El Elyon, the Most High God. El Elyon is a Hebrew uh, uh, string of words that means the Most High God. And I want to look at this today. It is so important that we understand and have this revelation that Abram had of God most high. As a matter of fact, the name El Elyon, it speaks to the elevated God. He is a God that is elevated above all things. Not only is he an elevated God, but he is a God that elevates his people. He doesn't rule and reign like normal kings who want to be elevated so that he can lord it over his people and keep them low. No, our God is the most high God and he is high. And so he likes to bring his people up with him. The word Elyon is not an unfamiliar word throughout the New Testament. As a matter of fact, Elyon is quite a common word throughout the Old Testament scriptures. Elyon simply means the highest place. 
It means the most high place. The word Elyon is used many times in the Bible to refer to both geographical places and also people. Elyon is used to refer to high places where people actually worshiped false gods and foreign idols. It was said that they would go to Elyon, the highest place, to worship these, these false gods and demonic deities in Old Testament times. It is used to refer to the highest position in the land. Matter of fact, Elyon is used to refer of a king who put his son into Elyon, the highest place of leadership authority. It is used to refer to highest positions. And so when you add El to Elyon, it changes the word drastically. El meaning God, Elyon meaning the highest place. These two words together form this name that is ascribed to our God, El Elyon. The literal definition of this word is the extremely exalted supreme high God. Extremely exalted supreme high God. It is so important that we understand that we do not just serve a God who's big or we don't just serve a God who is high. No, he is extremely exalted. He is supreme over any other thing. He's not just Lord, he is Lord of Lords. Not just God, but God of gods. Not just King, but King of kings. He is the most high God. If you believe that, shout amen today. This is important. We need to get this in our heart because we need to understand who our God is. We need to, like Abram, have a revelation that he's not just God, but he's the most high God. I wanna give you just a couple of things to write down today. And it's so important you do. How many know you're like 90% more likely to go to heaven if you take notes in church? I'm sure it's true. Well, listen, at least you won't forget on Monday what we talked about. I wanna get a couple of things in your heart that I feel are so important that we get into our spirit especially in the days we are living in. And the first thing I want you to get about El Elyon is this. Number one, our God is elevated above all things. He is elevated above all things in a time when so many things are being elevated. You need to understand that our God is higher still. That no matter what kind of battles and, and, and things that are happening around the world, no matter what kind of mountain or obstacle you're facing in your life, you need to know that our God is elevated above all of those things. It's so important for us sometimes to just take a step back and evaluate our lives. And we need to ask ourselves a question, what is elevated in your life right now? What is the most elevated thing in your life? Perhaps it's the wars that are happening around the world. It'd be so easy to put our mind and our thoughts on these wars and what's gonna happen and are we gonna get pulled into this thing? And how is this impacting the world and what will this mean to me? Perhaps it could be the political climate that's turning all the way up. Come on. It, it'd be so easy for us to look at this and look at all the things that are happening right now and what's happening in, our, in, in what is supposed to be this democratic process of voting that we have in our nation and, 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 and political candidates are, are, are they're attempting to assassinate and people are stepping down and rising. What is happening in our, it'd be so easy for this to be elevated in our lives right now and to completely block anything else. Perhaps it's a personal mountain in your life. Perhaps there is a word that has been declared over you. Maybe something like divorce, like bankruptcy, like cancer. Maybe there's this mountain that's in front of you right now and it just seems to be the most elevated thing in your life. I came to remind you today that he is high above any other name. That our God is elevated above any other thing in your life. He is an elevated God. And not only is he an elevated God, he is a God that elevates his people high above all things. He's a God that lifts us out and lifts us up. And we are living in days when we need to remind ourselves that all of the things that are happening in this life are not greater than our God. And although things may be high, they are not higher than our God. And not only do we need to remind ourselves, but we need to remind the people around us that no matter what is going on, our God is greater still. Amen. We must. 
Nothing is bigger than our God. Nothing is beyond him. Nothing can supplant his place on the throne. He rules and he reigns. And this is so very important. And I wanna give you a truth that's very deep, but I want you to get this into your hearts today. This is so important that we understand for this reason, and you can write this down, we will live under the shadow of whatever we perceive as highest in our lives. We as people will live under the shadow of whatever we perceive is highest in our lives. Listen, so many of us, we live under the shadow of our past and under the shadow of our mistakes. So many of us, we live under what is heavy. We live under the heaviness of what was or what could have been. Well, if I only would have did this different, if I only would have taken that opportunity, if I, if I just wouldn't have done that thing or crossed that line or burned that bridge, we live under the shadow of what could have been. We live under the shame of what happened. We live under the guilt and the regret of what was in our lives. If I'm honest with you, I've fallen into this in my own life. I remember one time specifically, I was a brand new Christian. And although Jesus had saved me and I was doing my best to serve him, it just seemed like there was a cloud over my life. My first couple of years as a Christian, yeah, there was joy to it, but if I'm honest, there was a lot of heaviness to it as well. It just seems like I couldn't come out from under the shadow of the life that I had lived before I met Jesus. It was just like the guilt and regret and the, 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 the mountain of my past just seemed to overshadow my life. And no matter what I did, I couldn't hide from the shadow I was living under. And it impacted the way I thought and the way I lived and what I believed I could do. It impacted the way I saw my future because I was still living under the shadow of my past. And it wasn't until I would have an encounter with God in a time of prayer. And I didn't realize it at the time, but my eyes were open to see that God was so much bigger so much larger, so much more powerful than anything that was in my past. And it began to set me free. I didn't realize till much later, it was because I'd had, an eleva- I'd had a revelation of El Elyon, the most high God. That although those things in my past were big, my God was bigger still. And can I tell you, no matter what you've come out of, they're not bigger than the God who's brought you into his family. No matter what's happened in your past, it's not bigger than the God who authors your future. No, we've got we've to begin to see our God as bigger than whatever it is we're coming out of because we will live under the shadow of whatever we perceive as biggest in our life. And you need to know that your God is bigger than where you came from, bigger than what you're fighting, bigger than what's behind you. One of my favorite scriptures is Psalm 91, verses one and two. And it says, those who live in the shelter of the Most High Guess what name that is? Those who live in the shelter of El Elyon will find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. Those who live in the shelter of El Elyon, those who see their God as the most high God, they will find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. Hear me, friends, what overshadows you has an impact on your life. There is a substance to the shadows in your life. There's a substance to it. See, whatever overshadows you, it means, first of all, that you see it as big. Second of all, it means you're close to it. How many know you can't be in the shadow of something and be far away from it? If we're going to live under the shadow of our past, it means that we're close to it. If we live under the shadow of what was, it means we're walking close to it. But if we choose to live under the shadow of the most high God, it means that we're closer to him than anything else. It means that he defines me, not where I came from. It means he defines me, not what I, the opportunities I missed. It means I see him as greater and bigger than anything else in my life. My friends, if your life is overshadowed by, by trouble and trial and trauma, then your life will be filled with anxiety and heaviness. But if you can catch a revelation that nothing is higher than the most high God and that we live in the shelter of his presence, then we will find rest in the shadow of the almighty God. 
We are filled with what is over us. And El Elyon is filled with peace, with rest, with strength, and with victory. So many times we need to take a step back and ask ourselves, what shadow am I living under? What shadow am I living under? Am I living under the shadow of the Most High God? Or am I living under the shadow of other things? And this is important because it doesn't just impact our lives. How many know that the promises of God and the the gospel is not just for us, but it's for those who would be impacted by how the gospel impacts us? Jesus has not just called us to keep this good news and keep a transformed lives to ourselves. No, he said, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. We are the priests of God, the carriers of the gospel message. How many know you are God's people? If you believe that, shout amen. amen. Listen, it's not just about us. It's about what kind of a wake are we leaving behind? And I want you to understand the shadow you live under doesn't just impact you, it impacts what's under you. See, what is under us is determined by what is over us. You will never be able to give away something different than what you're living under. This is why we must deal with what overshadows our life. There's a very interesting story that gives us the extreme of this in Acts chapter five, verses 15 and 16. It gives us this unique and supernatural picture of the power of what overshadows us. And in Acts five fifteen, it says, as a result of the apostles' work, sick people were brought out into the streets on beds and mats so that Peter's shadow might fall across some of them as he went by. And crowds came from the villages around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those possessed by evil spirits, and they were all healed. The power of a shadow. What was so powerful about it? Was it that Peter innately was some kind of superhuman or demigod? Absolutely not. Peter is not to be put on a pedestal and worshiped. No more than any other man. How many know we worship one name and one name alone? And it is the name of Jesus Christ. But this is a extreme and dynamic picture of the power of what overshadows you. What was powerful about Peter was whose shadow he was living under. See, when you walk close with God, it impacts the way you impact the world around you. Because he was living under the shadow of the Almighty, the impact of his life represented the impact of the one he was living under. And my friends, I want to encourage you, if you're living under a shadow of depression, it's depression that you'll give away. But if you're living under the shadow of joy, it's joy that you're going to give away. If you're living in the shadow of freedom, it's freedom you're going to give away. If you're living under the shadow of grace, it's grace you're going to give away. And so there's more, there's more depending on us making sure that we have the right picture of God, that we don't see other things in our life as bigger than our God. No, we serve El Elyon, the most high God. He's high above every other thing. He is the most high God. And we need to choose our shadow carefully. I don't wanna live under the shadow of my past. I don't wanna live under the shadow of regret. I don't wanna live under the shadow of guilt and shame. I wanna live under the shadow of God that I might find grace and help and peace and strength and have a clear vision for who my God is. He's bigger than anything I'm up against. He's bigger than anything I've come out of. And he's big enough to lead me forward in life. If you're grateful for that, shout amen today. He is the most high God. He is high above every other thing. And we need to be intentional with what we perceive as the highest thing in our life. Practically, this looks like the moment something tries to take first place, you come against that. And you remind yourself, my God is bigger than that thing. The moment it rises up in your heart, the moment it fills your mind, you take it captive and you remind yourself, my God is bigger than that. This is big, but God is bigger still. This is bad, but God is bigger still. You remind yourself that there is nothing higher than the most high God. He's high above all things. And one of the way, he is the elevated God, but he's the God that elevates his people. And one of the ways he elevates his people, and I want you to get this today. It's all we'll have time for. But number two, I want you to write this down. Our God elevates us into a new identity. 
He elevates us into a new identity. Melchizedek blessed Abram with this blessing. Blessed be Abram by God most high, the creator of heaven and earth. Melchizedek blessed Abram. Listen, he said, blessed be Abram of El Elyon, God most high. Have you ever studied your surname or your last name? We'd call it our last name here in the West. Okay, but your, your surname or your last name, typically, especially in America, usually points back uh, to some kind of a trade or a job. Perhaps if you come from a certain family, it might be a family name that you brought with you. But a lot of our surnames pointed back to an occupation, if you've been a part of the church for very long, you've, you've probably heard me talk about the fact I was adopted when I was five years old. And my, my adoptive father, obviously, was Hodges, Jeff Hodges. And so today, I'm Jordan Hodges because I was legally adopted by my father when I was five years old. My biological father carried the last name Howard. And Howard was originally an occupational name, meaning a sheep herder. Oddly enough, I come from shepherds, <laughs> meaning sheep herder. Listen, these names were given to distinguish us from other people. I, I don't come from Jordan the Shoemakers or Jordan the Carpenters, yeah. but I come from Jordan the Howards, the sheep herders. This was even true for Jesus. Jesus was not a rare name in biblical times. Matter of fact, we translate his name Jesus today, but that name actually comes from the name uh, Yeshua or Joshua. Okay, so Yeshua or Joshua, which by the way, some of the most irritating people are the ones that get hung up on the Yeshua. <laughs> Had a guy one time, we sang the song, speak the name of Jesus, and he sat behind me and said, I just wanna speak the name of Yeshua, and he screamed it into my ear, trying to make a point. Took all I had not to have security, tear him out of here, come on. I kid, kind of. Listen, unclutch your pearls a little bit. It's okay that we pronounce his name Jesus. But listen, there were, there were Yeshua or Jesus, there were Joshua's everywhere. That's why later in the scripture, after the fame of Jesus began to spread, everywhere, they begin to call him Jesus of Nazareth to identify him. He wasn't Jesus of Jerusalem or Jesus of Damascus. No, he was Jesus of Nazareth. But he wasn't just any Jesus. As a matter of fact, as the revelation of who he was would get greater and greater, he would later be known as Jesus the Christ or Christos, the anointed one, the son of God, the lamb of God, the Messiah the one who was and is and is to come, almighty God. So listen, I'm going somewhere with this. So God says, blessed be Abram of El Elyon. In other words, he identifies Abram by his own name. He, uh, he re-identifies Abram. As a matter of fact, a couple of chapters later, Abram would make covenant with God and he would be known as Abraham because God would give him a new name by inserting part of his name, Elohim, into Abram's name and he would forever be known as Abraham. Re-identifying Abram to be, we don't sing Father Abram had many sons. Yeah. We sing Father Abraham had many sons because God re-identified Abram. You will no longer be Abram, you are now Abraham. Blessed be Abram by God most high. See, listen, you need to get this and you can write this down in your notes. In Christ, God elevates our identity by giving us his name. In Christ, he elevates our identity by giving us his name. Listen, you're not just Paul, you're Paul of God Most High. I'm not just Jordan, I'm Jordan of God Most High. In Christ, God elevates your life by giving you his name. Let me do a little Bible study for you. Starting in Numbers chapter six, verse 27, listen to this. So they shall put my name on the children of Israel and I will bless them. Deuteronomy 28.10, then all of the people of the earth shall see that you are called by my name. Listen, called by the name of the Lord. 2 Chronicles 7.14, which is always a family favorite during election times, amen. We should call ourselves to repentance 
last year, right? But, but we love this one. But let me give you a different focus, right? I love the seek my face, turn from your ways, hear your land. But let's pay attention to the front part. Second Chronicles 7, 14. Then if my people who are called by my name, this is who that is addressed to. Those that carry the name of the Lord. Jeremiah 14, 9. Why should we be like a man astonished, like a mighty one who cannot save? Yet you, O Lord, are in our midst, and we are called by your name. Let me bring this into the New Testament. Galatians 3, 14. Through Christ Jesus, listen to this, God has blessed the Gentiles. Who's a Gentile? What's this Bible word mean? It's anyone that is not born a actual Jew. Everybody say, that's me. All right, Idahoans, Californian implants, come on. You're probably not a Jew by birth. That means you're a Gentile. That means this is you. God has blessed the Gentiles, listen, with the same blessing he promised to Abraham. Uh Uh-oh. So that we who are believers might receive the promised Holy Spirit through faith. How many are glad that this promise, this blessing, this covenant was not for one specific group of people, not just one demographic or for one time. This blessing is for all men, all women, everywhere, and for all time. God has blessed us with the same blessing he promised to Abraham so that we who are believers in Christ might receive the promised Holy Spirit through faith. Acts 15, 16, and 17 After this, I will return and rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins and I will set it up so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord. Even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who does all of these things. It is so important in life that you recognize whose you are and whose name you carry. If you are a follower of Jesus, you are not like everyone else. God marked Abram. He said, no, no, you're not just Abram whoever. You are Abram of God most high. He marked Abram. He said, Abram, that's my guy. Blessed is Abram of El Elyon. You need to understand when you come to faith in Jesus, you get more than a ticket into the club of Christianity. You get washed, regenerated, renewed, born again, and brought into the very family of God. And God has promised nobody in his family will be an orphan. That means it doesn't matter what your name was, what your last name is. When you become a Christian, you become blessed as Amanda of God Most High. Blessed is Steve of God Most High. Blessed is Bill of God Most High. And in case you're confused of who God Most High is, the creator of heaven and earth is what he said. You got to understand God marks you. The Bible says even the Holy Spirit that's given us, it's a seal upon our life. In other words, God marks you. He says, they're not an orphan. No, they're part of my family and I'm marking them. I'm putting my spirit upon them. I'm putting my spirit within them. They belong to me now. They are my people that have been washed by the blood of my son. They carry my spirit and there's a seal upon their life. That means no enemy can take you out. That means no devil can be victorious over you. When you recognize you belong to El Elyon, the God most high. I'm not just Jordan, I'm Jordan of God most. You gotta remind yourself, not just of who you are, but of whose you are. I belong to Jesus. I am his and the seal of God is upon my life. So I cannot be shaken. I cannot be moved. I cannot be taken out of my Father's hand for the seal of God is upon my life and my God is greater than anything I will ever face in this life. He's the most high. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. This me, I'm getting excited here. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone and a new life has begun. I ran my car through the car wash. I'm not gonna lie to you, I need some accountability. My CFC bumper sticker came off my back window. 
That was what kept me from driving the way I want to drive sometimes. I got to put a new one on. Represent well. Come on. Some of y'all need to get a bumper sticker today and say, I love my church and I need to be accountable because I drive like a mad person. I know you. I see you out there. But listen, if you were not proud of your car, you would not put a big sticker that says, this car belongs to Pastor Mike Trenton, right? If you're not proud of your church, you wouldn't put a bumper sticker of your church. Can I tell you that God is not ashamed to put his name on you? You have the seal of the Holy Spirit. This is why it grieved Jesus' heart so much. He said, if you're ashamed of my father, if you're ashamed of me, then my father will be ashamed of you. Why? Because he's already put his name on you. The least we could do, the least we could do is be proud of God's name. Be proud of God's spirit that's upon us. See, God takes pride in displaying you as his own. God has placed and declared his name and his spirit on you for the entire spiritual realm to see. Ephesians 1 13 and 14 says, and now you Gentiles, say that's me. There's like one Jew in here that's like, how dare you? I know it, I can feel you. Maybe you're watching online, I don't know. But for most of us, and now you Gentiles, listen, have also heard the truth, the good news that God saves you. And when you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit whom he promised long ago. The Spirit is God's guarantee that he will give us an inheritance he promised and that he has purchased us to be his own people. He did this so that you would praise and glorify him. Listen, this seal that God gives us, it's not visible like a tattoo, but trust me, every spiritual power in the heavenly places sees it. Every low thing, every demon, every curse, every attack that would come against your life sees the name of the Lord that is upon your heart. But you know what? So does every blessing. So does every answer to your prayer. So does every promise of God. So does every warring angel. It sees the name of the Lord upon your life and are attracted to the name of God that is upon the people of God. You have been elevated into a new identity. You have been raised to life in Christ. You have been given a new spirit. And it's not a spirit who is a slave to fear. No, it is a spirit of power and love and of self-discipline, a power to live for God and live out the call of God upon your life. You need to understand when God elevates you, he doesn't just elevate you into something. That means he elevates you out of something and into something new. How many are grateful that when you came to know Christ, he elevated you into his kingdom and out of the kingdom of darkness? Listen, some of you are here today and God wants to elevate you into freedom and out of bondage, into joy and out of depression, into peace and out of anxiety. He doesn't just elevate you into, he elevates you out of. Some of you are here and you're still living with the weight of your past. You're still living with the burdens of your failure. Jesus wants to elevate you into forgiveness and out of the life that you're coming out of. There's a brand new life for you. Anyone who's in Christ is a new creation. Maybe you're here today and you'd say, God would never love me. God already proved he loved you by sending his son to die for you before you ever did anything for him. He did everything for you. By trusting in Jesus, you can be elevated out of your past. By believing in Christ, you can be elevated out of whatever you're coming out of. By grabbing a hold of the promises of God, you can be elevated out of where you are in life. The life of the believer is a life of elevation. He is the most high God, the elevated God that elevates his people. If you believe that, shout amen. Amen. I want you to stand to your feet all across the room today. I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful that our God is high above every other thing. I'm so thankful that God has elevated us into a new identity, that any who have put their trust in Jesus, the old has gone and new has come, that God's giving you a new opportunity. God's giving you an open door. He is the elevated God and he wants to elevate you. I'd like to invite our prayer teams to come forward just as we open our altars every single week that anyone who would need prayer can come. I wanna pray for you today. 
And I'm believing that the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, revealing to you the elevated God. Listen, some of you are here today and you are not where you need to be with Jesus. You are still under the weight and the past of your sin and where you came from. Jesus died that you might be elevated into a place of a son or a daughter of God and out of a place of sin and brokenness. He wants to save you, to wash you, to give you a brand new life. Listen, one of the main things we pray for, this is a church that believes in two things very strongly, winning souls and building the local church. Jesus has already won. You can receive that today. You can believe upon Christ and be elevated. Maybe you're here today and you're caught in something. You're living a life that's less than what God has. There's an area of your life that if you're honest, you'd say, I need to be elevated out of and into something more. I believe that just a revelation of God can change that. When you begin to see that he's bigger than what you're battling, he can lift you out of it. Come on, our God is not a dead God. He's a living God that is alive and elevates his people higher and higher and higher. I want you to lift your hands to heaven all over this room. And listen, I'm believing that many are gonna come forward and receive prayer today, that the Lord would open up our eyes and give us a revelation that he's not the most low God, he's the most high God. He's high above everything we're going through. So Father, right now you see everything that we need. You are El Elyon, you are the most high God. Father, I pray now that if there are any who don't know you in a personal way, that Jesus, you would get a hold of their hearts, right? That they would cry out to you and believe in you and that you would elevate them out of their sin and into the life that you have for them, out of their past and into the future you've ordained for them. And Lord, all across this room, for all those who love you and are walking with you the best that they know how, I pray that every arena of their life, you'd search it. God, you know us. You know even the secret places of our heart. And if there's an area we need lifted out of, I pray right now they would call upon your name, that you would open up their eyes to see that God, you are bigger than their financial difficulty. You are bigger than their, their emotional instability. You are bigger than the depression, the anxiety, the heart problems, the physical ailments, that God, you would lift them out supernaturally. You are the elevated God. Elevate your people today out of and into the life of God. We believe for that in Jesus' mighty name. Everybody said amen. Amen. Come on, let's end the